Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And we're going to continue from where we were yesterday, uh, discussing these lines, Daniel chapter 11, uh, verse uh, 23 to 24. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? A dear, gracious Heavenly Father, we invite your presence here. And we ask for the comfort of thy spirit to show us our need of you and the work that you want to do in our lives, that we can glorify your name on this earth. And we pray that uh, as we open your word, that your Holy Spirit can be here to teach us, and um, that all those who are searching for truth um, can accept the light, and that they can continually walk in this advancing light. Thank you, Lord, um, for each of the people who are studying the friendships that we develop, and uh, and for we pray for our loved ones, our family and friends, and those that we have contact with. And we pray now, Lord, that the things that we study will help us in our day-to-day life. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. So um, you can see I changed a few things on this chart, which we will discuss whether this change is sensible or not. Obviously, we don't want to have that first first angel formalized just hanging there in midair like that. That's an extra one that we don't need. Let's get rid of that. Okay, so we had discussed about these way marks yesterday, whether we should um, leave them as they were or whether we should add uh, the siege of Jerusalem. And I, I definitely think we need the siege of Jerusalem in here, in this progression. Now there are another another event. There are a number of other options. Um, so I'm I'm going to save this. I'm going to copy, duplicate. I probably could have done that before. So, um, so I'm keeping the other one like it was, and this is a new one in front of you. It looks exactly the same because it is, but it's another page. And, and this one, we're going to look at some other options that we have. So what are other options that we have? I want to see if anybody um, thinks like I do. So we had moved. What I did in this one is I moved the first angel from 161 to 158. I moved that. And I don't know if I really like that. It is I would rather have uh, the first angel arriving here, right, in this period, so I'm going to move this up. I would rather that be the first angel arriving, because I think that makes more sense. But this is kind of what we had before a bit, except that um, we didn't have the siege of Jerusalem. So what other options do I have? I could move this over here, back where, so, so now the Battle of Pharsalus you guys need to give me more input here. Um, but if I did this, then we don't have the Battle of Pharsalus as a waymark. Why do you see Pharsalus as being so important? Well, because it's a part of this structure of these um, even for a time. So we got the 360s, the two 360s, and, and we have the symbolism there of uh, the Hebrew numbers between them, the beginnings and the ends of these states the oppression and the naked, uh, stripped and destitute symbols. And and we already, we we have to have um, the Battle of Actium here. I mean, it's it's going to describe that in the next section. It's going to deal with that history. But there there is another option that that we could have here. The one thing we could do is we could just say that these two, are the same way mark and that this period is it has two way marks in it but those are really the same way mark they're the beginning of a 360 year period now this would make this way mark also one way mark so the edict of milan to uh, the removal of the capital of rome from the city of rome to constantinople would be the third angel arriving and that then, looks a little bit better. Yeah. And then what this would do here is we would have to 
um, move this formalization to the stoning of Stephen. So this, this formalization here would be the stoning of Stephen. And then this second angel empowered would be the destruction of the temple. Now, does that, does this make sense? Well, as you were, as you were just addressing this, I was having to consider if the second angel's empowerment was not also a time period, just like you were placing the first angel's empowerment. So if the second angel's empowerment was from 70 AD to 313, just as the first angel's empowerment is from 48 BC to 31 BC. Okay. So, uh, so you would put the empowerment here and you would put the second angel uh, formalization here. Well, when I'm looking at what you just did with the first angel's empowerment, mm. placing it as a period between 48 BC and 31 BC, a period of 15 years, or sorry, 17 years. Yeah. If the empowerment was between 70 AD and 313 AD, would that make sense? Yeah, well, that's what I put there. I think that makes sense. You've got 313, and then this goes all the way over to 330. Oh, I see what you're saying. You want to put it between 70 and here? Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, I would put it over because those two need to be one way mark. Okay. Right. All right. So either they are the third angel arriving or they're the second angel's empowerment. But we have to, we haven't decided exactly what these, these angels are, what these messages are. Right. We, we've just, we put these way marks here. We haven't really well defined this. I mean, we know that the period of darkness has to do with the role of Rome. That is, the Jews are not understanding the significance of the role of Rome in relation to the Messiah. They haven't fully grasped that idea. Right. So they don't understand Daniel's prophecies and, and they don't see Rome. I mean, Rome isn't there yet. Right. So. You know, and I and I don't believe that they're they're understanding the Tychus Epiphanies. You know, well, there's debate about that, but I mean, they may have later applied the Tychus Epiphanies to to Daniel, but initially they don't really have an understanding of it. We don't know what they understood, but they obviously don't understand the significance of Rome because they're going to make a league with Rome. Right. So they don't know Rome is the fourth kingdom. And so they're going to have this league with Rome. Now, now, one of the things that, you know, we know about this 158 BC is that Miller's going to attach it to 666 years. Right. Correct. Now, we could, and this might make, make more sense. So I'm just going to move some of this stuff over a bit. Because we do have the 666 years, and, and, and that addresses Rome, and maybe it would make the most sense to put 508 over here as the seventh way mark. Where are we in this? And we just put 508. And then that gives us that 666 years. So we would have from here. That be considered a 666 year inclusive? Yeah, it's an inclusive count. That's the way we understand it. Put this over here. Okay. So this, this changes a few things, but gives us that 666 years, which we already understand for Rome. I don't want to have cross it. I don't know what 666. I guess I could put the asterisk just to show that it's inclusive. Okay. So we got 666 years now. And so we're saying that verses 23 and 24, they're going to begin as Miller began it with 158 BC. And he, he's going to count the 666 years. And so those 666 years, they're going to end in 508. And then we would have to understand what this means as a line. So if we're going to do this line, 
we, we now need an explanation for these waymarks and what they, they represent and why, um, why these two verses are giving us this line. And, and we already know that they relate to something in our history, right? So, um, so we've got this 666 number. We'd, we'd have to relate this to our history. We already have done that with some of the spans of time. Uh, being the 6256 days. But, but this, but this is a line that we can look at and see if this, this makes sense. Okay. Any thoughts about this so far? I think this is an improvement over yesterday. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, I, I mean, I definitely like the idea that we take the two 360 year periods and make them in a sense as one way mark. Because it's just one prophecy, but we have two applications of it. And so it doesn't make sense to make them separate waymarks, right? You understand what I'm saying there? I get it. Yeah, and, and, and the symbolism all fits really well. Now, now when you have something like, you know, a formalization, um, an empowerment, you know, an arrival, we, we generally have, we have to have some message that's there. And why a particular thing uh, is an arrival or a formalization or an empowerment. And, I mean, for instance, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. In some lines, that would be an empowerment, right? But in this line, it would be a formalization. That is, this line is not so much about, um, I mean, this is about Rome and its relationship to the Jewish nation. Right. So it's not just about the Jews. It's about this league with Rome. And, and you know, the thing I like most about this is its connection to uh, Miller's 666 years. So that to me is, um, you know, something that, that I think uh, lends uh, validity to this line. Just adding that there. So you got an asterisk, it means inclusive. <clears throat> okay, so we say it's an improvement. Now, what what is this about? We know the Jews failed to realize the prophetic significance of Rome in relation to the Messiah. So we have that as the first message, or that's that's actually the period of darkness, right? So you have the Greek dominion over the Jewish nation. There is a lack of understanding regarding Rome, and so. We're going to have the Roman Jewish League. And that's going to be the time of the end. And, and like many of the times of the ends, we have um, a connection with different periods. For instance, in the time of the end, we have um, for Babylon, right? Babylon is going to fall on October 13th, uh, 539. And then we're going to have in uh, 536, we're going to have the issuing of this decree, right? In the fall of 537, Cyrus is going to become uh, the king of Babylon with the death of his uncle, uh, Cyaxares, which is the rise to me. And then uh, six months later, he's going to issue the decree, right? So, so there is a period of time there. We also have something similar in 1989. So in 1989, we have the Berlin Wall, and then the fall of the Soviet Union, a period of 777 days inclusive. And even when we look at the time of the end in 1798, we have the Pope being taken captive, February 15th, 1798. And then he's going to die in exile on August 29th, uh, 1799, right? So there are two dates there. So, so to me, that's one of the things that would... Uh, allow this to be the time of the end. Plus, there's just the other things about it. It would make more sense as the time of the end. Now, if it's the time of the end, um, and it's a three-step testing prophetic message, uh, when we have the third angel arrive in 508, that makes sense, the 666 years. Okay? But then we have to figure out, okay, what is happening here? What is? What are these messages why is the second angel arriving uh the cross so we have the cross there 
to what is the first message, what is the second message, and then how is this related to the third message. Now, uh, who's being tested in this history? You know, in Millerite history, you have Protestants and then Millerites being tested under the first and second angel's message. So do we have anybody being tested under these messages? God's people. Okay, well, God's people. Um, are God's people being tested in the first message and the second message? Well, of course. Okay. And then it's a two-step testing prophetic message? No, and it's it's still a three-step prophetic testing message. Two-step testing prophetic message. And the first two steps are going to develop um, the two classes. And then the third step will demonstrate that. Generally, that's how we understand it. Right. Okay. Now, we have, um, obviously, the, God's people here represent, these are the Jews. And, but we do know that Christians are going to be involved. Because uh, when you have the Edict of Milan, that's going to be about Christianity. And then when, you know, Rome moves its capital to Constantinople, that opens up the way for the papacy uh, to become the head of this, you know, Ro- the, the Roman Catholic Church. Now, we could say, well, maybe if they never moved it, it you know, it, it might have been different. We know that Rome and Alexandria were in competition with each other as far as which bishop was the most important. And, and maybe if, you know, I mean, if, ifs are big things, but. Uh, maybe it would have been different if Constantinople hadn't become the capital of Rome. Obviously, it'd be way different. But I'm just saying, as far as um, is it the Roman Catholic Church, but you know, it, it, history is what it is. The point is, we have this is about Rome. So we know that when in 508, there's going to be a 30 year period that opens the way. Um, for the for the Roman bishop to begin, you know, the Pope uh, to begin the 1260 years. So, um, so you got the 30 years. 508 starts the 1290. So we got the 666 here. Any any further thoughts on this? How how we're going to define these messages? Okay. So so if we go back to the beginning, there we see there's this Roman Jewish league. Now, the Jews, why do they have a league with Rome? They want to be protected, right? But Rome ends up coming 95 years later and uh, taking over Jerusalem. Now, I tried to find a date for Pompey's siege of Jerusalem. I mean, we do know that it's going to be Passover um, when they're... Um, you know, they're trapped in the city at Passover time. Um, I was reading up on it. Um, it's in Maccabees, um, first Maccabees eight verses. Let me see where was this one? No, that's not it. I'm trying to remember. Okay. No, it wasn't in Maccabees. I was looking at other stuff in Maccabees dealing with 158. Um, I mean, it's probably in Maccabees, but that's not where I was reading it. So it says here, I'm just skimming through. So there is a conflict between two Jewish princes that had escalated. And the Pharisees sided with Hyrcanus and the Sadducees with Aristobulus. During the festival of Passover in 63 BC, Aristobulus and the Sadducees were besieged in the temple of Jerusalem by Hyrcanus and his ally. The Arab king Arates of Petra. So, so this isn't, um, so when they're in, um, during Passover, uh, there's actually a conflict going on in Jerusalem where, uh, the Sadducees are, are trapped in the temple by the Pharisees, basically. So, so if we look at Pompey's siege of Jerusalem and we try to understand it here, I don't know. I'm just going to read a bit more here. Um, however, Aristobulus managed to send an envoy to Pompey's representative in Syria, Marcus Emilius 
Scarus, the Jewish leader, promised 8,000 kilograms of silver, an offer that Emilius could not refuse. He immediately ordered Aretas to leave. When Pompey arrived on the scene, he received an even larger present. Aristobulus sent him a golden vine, no less than 800 kilograms. That's quite a bit, 1,700 pounds or something which the Romans commander forwarded to the temple of Jupiter in Rome. Having gained Pompey's favor, Aristobulus was saved from his brother. Unfortunately, it made a mistake. He sent an envoy to Pompey asking him to punish Aemilius, who, according to Aristobulus, had extorted from him 8,000 kilograms of silver. Pompey decided to come to Jerusalem to see for himself what was going on. There, he sided with Hyrcanus and had Aristobulus arrested. Hyrcanus' followers allowed Pompey to enter the lower tower, lower town of Jerusalem, but Aristobulus' adherents, the Sadducees, still occupied the temple. In the west, there was a bridge between the temple and the city, but this had been destroyed. In the south and east, there were deep valleys. Therefore, Pompey decided to attack from the north. They only worked on the siege dams on the Sabbaths because the Jews could defend themselves on that um that on, on that days, but were not allowed to attack. When the siege dam was completed, towers were rolled towards the wall of the temple. Catapults kept up a continuous pressure by hurling heavy stones. A battering ram broke the wall, and Pompey's soldiers entered the temple terrace, where they started to kill the defenders. Many Jewish soldiers committed suicide because they did not want to see the profanation of the sanctuary. When the Romans controlled the temple, Pompey and his officers enter the Holy of Holies, according to the Jewish, the Jews, a blasphemous act, because only the high priest was allowed to enter this room. The conqueror saw the menorah, the treasure, and all sacred vessels. His soldiers seem to have sacrificed to their standards. And this is listed in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I tried to find it. Uh, but anyway, next day he ordered the cleansing of the temple, and he appointed Hyrcanus as high priest. Meanwhile, Marcus Aemilius Scarus attacked Aretas of Petra, but allowed himself to be bribed. Uh, um, anyway, I think the rest of this. So large parts of the Jewish kingdom, essentially the most Hellenized regions, were annexed by the Romans. From now on, Judea and Galilee were just one of Rome's client kingdoms in the east. Mercanus was high priest and received the title Ethnarch. His position was safe, although Aristobulus tried to come back from Rome in 57-55 BC. In 49, however, there appeared a dark cloud on the horizon. A civil war broke out in the Roman Empire. Pompey was defeated by Julius Caesar, who pursued his enemy to the east. Uh, Caesar chose to cooperate with Hyrcanus, but appointed the latter's courtier Antipater. When war broke out with the Parthians, Hyrcanus was taken prisoner. Antipater's son, Herod, managed to bring him home, but Hyrcanus was no longer high priest, and Herod, who became king, had him executed in 31 BC. So we got 31 BC mentioned there in a different context. Okay, so we got Pompey's siege of Jerusalem. So um, we don't have a date for this siege, other than we know that at Passover time, we have the Sadducees, hold up in the temple but we don't have a timeline i couldn't find anything beyond that so what would this siege of jerusalem have to do with the roman jewish league as as far as a formalization of it because now it's it's in a sense a civil war between the sadducees and the pharisees that causes pompey to come and have this siege okay consider this if the Sadducees are seen as the liberals, the south and the Pharisees are seen as the conservatives or the north okay now the other the other part of this with Pompey's siege of Jerusalem when we're looking at this in 161 or 158 back to the Right. The Jews are looking to become friends of Rome. Mm -hmm. By 
63, Rome is not looking so much for friends, but they're looking for those that will help them be supported. This is why Egypt was so important, because Egypt became the breadbasket of Rome. Mm-hmm. What was what was being contributed by the Jews? I mean, I don't know. The only thing that Rome would see them contribute would have been taxes. Yeah, taxes. Now, there's also trade that goes through that area, but um, but yeah, it would be money. Okay. Not looking for military support so much from the Jews. No. So they, they do use it at times. Were the Jews helping to stabilize Roman interests throughout that region? Yeah. Were they? Well, initially. I mean, they're, they, we, we, we talked about it where they, they're going to be supporting the, the Romans in their fight against Egypt, I believe. By 63, were the By- Jews supporting Roman interests in Syria or in, in other no, portions? In that period, no. Okay. So Rome is looking at this, that what are they really doing? What's, what is their value? Mm-hmm. So because of that, they then come in to take control of what's going on to say, we are now your police force. We are going to protect you. And for this protection, you're going to have to pay. Yeah. So this is no longer a league of equals. This is now Rome has taken control of the area. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So now we have this situation. We're going from this portion to where Rome has now formalized their control of the area. Is this in keeping with what we have read before out of Leviticus 26? Mm -hmm. So if this is in keeping with Leviticus 26, is this typifying the fourth seven times of Leviticus 26? Well, it's more Deuteronomy 28, but because the four seven times don't include Rome. How do we know that? Well, because it's dealing with Babylon. So the four seven times are Babylon's siege and destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, Deuteronomy 28 refers to Rome. And, and we find that when Daniel quotes, Daniel chapter 8 quotes Deuteronomy 28, dealing with Rome. So they're sister chapters, but one deals with Babylon, one deals with Rome. And that's why the 666 years between the siege that's mentioned in Leviticus 26, where Jehoiachim is taken captive, uh, to um, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD by Rome, that's mentioned in Deuteronomy 28. So those two different sieges are connected by 666 years. So, so when we're dealing with, with Rome, we're dealing with Deuteronomy 28, not Leviticus 26. But when... Jehoiakim is or Jehoiachin is taken captive. Mm-hmm. Isn't that removing the pride of the power of Jerusalem? Uh, the pride of the power of Jerusalem, no, because the pride of the power that's Manasseh's captivity. Then oh. you have the wild beast that's Daniel's captivity. Then you have the siege with the ten women baking the bread in one oven and. Uh, the uh, what's the word something of the covenant uh, can't think of the phrase it's uh, yeah the quarrel of my covenant right so that's going to be Jehoiachin's captivity and then there's so that's Leviticus 26 that's dealing with Babylon right that's not dealing with Rome so the four seven times are literally fulfilled with Babylon and the Jews Deuteronomy 28 doesn't address Babylon, it addresses Rome. So Deuteronomy 28 is going to talk about, you know, um, 
If you look at Deuteronomy 28, I'll just give you these verses. It's like 51 or something like that. 50, verse 50, 49 and 50, it starts. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. And he shall eat of the fruit of thy cattle and of the fruit of thy land, until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee, either corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of thine kind, or flocks of thy sheep, until he have destroyed thee. And he will besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high and fenced walls come down, and wherein thou trustest throughout all thy land. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee. Right. It goes on about that people eating their children. Um, and and then in Daniel chapter eight, when it's talking then about Rome, it's going to say um, in verse uh, 22, 8, 22, it says, now that being broken, was, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom. When the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up and his power shall destroy, shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper in practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Right. So this is going to be Rome. So that's quoting uh, the king of fierce countenance. Right. And the understanding of dark sentences, the language that thou shalt not understand. So that's a reference there. Does that make sense? Okay. I, I'm not disagreeing with what you just said. Mm-hmm. Now, when I'm looking at this, 161 to 158, Jews felt that they could appeal to Rome and become friends with Rome. Right, because they don't understand Rome yet. And at that point, they viewed themselves as yet being a sovereign nation, when in fact they were not. They were just trading the Greek dominion for a dominion with Rome. Mm -hmm. They had come so far in not understanding the pride of their own power. That when Manasseh had been taken captive, their king had been taken captive, they wind up acceding to Babylon Mm -hmm. within a few years to where Babylon became the complete and dominant ruler of their region. Mm -hmm. Here we have them thinking that they are strong enough to be a friend of Rome, but within less than a 100 years, they are being shown just how strong Rome really was. So it became the formalization that they had lost their power and that they were now subservient. So here here we have this from 63 BC to 31 AD, a period of 93 years. Where, where, where are you going? Where's 93 years? 63 B.C. to 31 A.D. Yeah, so that's going to be 32 years. No. You're you're going to where? 63 B.C. to 31 A.D. Oh, oh, A.D. Okay. Yes, okay. Yeah, you're going to A.D. Yeah, so. Okay, I see what you're doing. Okay, I was was thinking 31 B.C. Okay, 31 A.D. So why are you going to 31 A.D.? What's the significance? When they when they traded their king, when they didn't understand that they were giving up the pride of their power in the period from 161 to 158, they then began to accept Rome as their king by force in 63. By 31, 
you have the high priest, not the ethnarch, the high priest saying before Caesar's representative, we have no king but Caesar. So they have traded completely their reliance upon our Heavenly Father, upon their Creator. Yeah, okay. So I wouldn't connect that with Leviticus 26, though. Okay. Yeah, All because what Leviticus 26 is, God is going to break the pride of your power. It's a progressive destruction of four. We don't have, a, a, in a reform line, you don't have a progressive destruction of four. Those precede a reform line. And so we would actually look back at what has happened before with, you know, um, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. You know, you could say that this is um, it's not a, it's 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 a, a, the fourth nation that they're going to come under. And this nation, they're going to make a league with it. I mean, there is obviously the idea of that you know, Christ is going to be um, the true king that they're going to reject. I mean, that's all valid. But I wouldn't attach it to the pride of power because that's not what's really happening here. They're just they're just yielding, you know, the idea that they're yielding um, by making this league, that they're yielding, they're rejecting Christ as king. And that's going to be pretty evident when the second angel arrives, Right. Because the second angel arrives, that group is being tested. So who's being tested in, in this period is the leadership of the Jews, right? And they're going to be tested. Are you going to accept uh, Christ as king or Rome as king, right? Okay. So, so the idea is right. I just wouldn't connect it to Leviticus 26 in, in that way. So, so we got... Um, the second angel arriving, and and as we we go through this, like uh, tomorrow we'll probably start putting this down in connection with our line a bit more. But we have this seventieth week, and and I really think that um, you know obviously the second angel arrives. We'll say it's on the cross, but it's in the midst of the week. So this twenty seven A D here, and the thirty four A D. These are actually going to be a parallel in our history with uh, the 777 structure to some degree. Oops, what am I doing? I need 27, not 77. 27. Just putting that here just so people know what it is. Okay, so we have, in our history, we have a a larger line. So if we're going to, one way that we can do this in our history is... um, we can take this as the 777 structure, and a lot of this other stuff would relate to 1989 and um, 9-11 and so forth. And I'm not sure exactly how that would line up. We'd have to look at more details of what we have written down. But this structure here is the history of Rome, and then we would have to figure out why does that, how does that parallel in our history? What is it? What is it symbolizing in our history? And we're saying that this is the Jews, depending upon Rome, and Rome's ultimately going to destroy it, right? It's going to destroy. Uh, it's going to crucify their Messiah. It's going to destroy their temple, and it's going to persecute them, because not just Christians are persecuted, but Jews are also persecuted in that that history. Uh, but ultimately, ultimately, it changes from Jews to Christians. And then we're going to have uh, apostate Christianity set up um, in this history, even though Christians are being persecuted. And then and then we're going to have that period of time uh, where we have uh, uh, 508 ends, right? And that's going to end the persecution of of um, the twelve, the, the time times and a half for the scattering of the power of the holy people in Daniel chapter twelve verse seven. But it's also persecution of Christians as well. So, I'm not sure exactly how we're going to uh, see that in our history. 
Okay, any other thoughts on what we have here? No more thoughts on that? Just generally over overall, I mean, this line may, makes some sense, but we still haven't um, addressed. So we got the formalization there. So let's just leave that. And then we have the first angel empowered. Now, the first angel empowered, now this is going to be addressing two time prophecies, even for a time, right? So two periods of 360 years. Uh, they, they're marked by a span of time, 6,233. The Hebrew number is translated as oppression. And then it's going to end with a period of 6,176 years, which the Hebrew number would be naked, stripped, destitute. And, and so we can see the parallel between these. So we have oppression. Now, oppression is a little bit different than to be destitute. So this shows that the Jews are going to be oppressed, and then ultimately everything is going to be taken away from them. They're, they're going to be destroyed. We also have this 700 and or the, the 343 years, which is seven times seven times seven, and we can see that that also relates to our 777 structure. And so we can look at the Battle of Actium and the Battle of Pharsalus together. Um, as representing the empowerment of the first message. So in our history, what would they be representing? Would we say it represents November 9th? I mean, we already kind of have this done, but you know, if we, we go back here. So let's, let's look at these verses again. So we go after the league. Now we're going to put that as 9-11. That's how we looked at it. The league represents 9-11. So in our history, if we're going to have this line, we can say it's 9-11. Okay. Um, so we don't have nine, 1989 here in this structure, the way that we've made this application. Well, you can't even see it. I didn't click on it properly. There we go. Okay. So after the league, the Jewish league, Roman Jewish league, I guess I should call it, <laughs> um, made with him, that is pagan Rome, the papacy in our history, right? Obviously there it's, uh, pagan Rome, uh, shall work deceitfully, use the league for furthering Roman interests in the eastern camp, eastern regions. Um, and then we're going to have this siege, right? For Pompey, Parminder shall come up, enter Judea, Syria, and shall become strong and numerous with a small people, nation. He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province. And he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. Now this is going to bring us to Titus's destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. He shall scatter, he shall scatter the, and the prey and spoil and riches. This is the diaspora. And he shall forecast his devices against, from the strongholds, even for a time. Right, so that's, so we have here, I put it Parminder in, so that's going to be the siege. Um, and then we'd have to give a date in our history in which we would place that. And then we have, um, so if we, if we did 9-11, so let's, let's do it this way here. So go back here. So we would say that this is a Roman Jewish league. This is 9-11. And then we have a period of time and we're going to say that this is talking about this movement, if, if this application is correct, of being Parminder, that there is a siege that occurs. Now, that siege is going to precede November 9th, right? So the siege is something that happens earlier. And we could put this as August 29th, 2019. This here, Farsalus, would be September 7th to November 9th. We have not looked at that really too much other other than that we know it's a period of uh, 63 days but we didn't put it in our interpretation of that so maybe that's what we would do is we put september 7th to here um and then we have uh the cross so we'd have to decide well if this is november 9th this would be july 18th possibly right 
This is just an idea. And then uh, 70 AD, the destruction of the temple, uh, that would be the, you know, maybe something like December 25th, 2021. I don't know. And then uh, we would have, um, we'd have to look at what the Edict of Milan and Constantinople typify in our history and what 508 typifies, right? That's, that's what we'd have to do if we're going to put this in our line, right? So we'd have to somehow figure out what we have as dates and what we have done with, especially when we deal with this, um, you know, and, and Pompey's siege of Jerusalem, we could even put it earlier. We could have have something to do with the time setting uh, of Parmenders, right? So maybe not August 29th, maybe the siege begins much sooner. Okay, um, so we might have other dates in our history, but but that, that's how we that's how we've interpreted the verse at this point that it's going to cover this history. We haven't interpreted everything in the verse, but it's it's going to begin at nine eleven. That's the way we understand. That's where the Roman Jewish League is in in our history in this particular line. So it's going to take a little bit of time to to sort out all the details. So, so we have a symbol here of the 777 structure. The 70, the 70th week symbolizes that. And we have, uh, this span of time, the 343 years also symbolizing the 777 structure. And, you know, so not sure. We might even have events here that we could mark on these dates. I don't know. Any thoughts? So that's me just thinking on my feet here, trying to, I mean, I'm pretty happy with, with the line. Now, if we're going to deal with the second angel, so we say the first, so let's go back to Rome, right? So we say God's people are being tested. They're going to be there. Uh, so the Jews, remember the Jews are going to be, uh, what's the word? Well, they're called the upright ones. That's going to be in, uh, I think it's verse 17. So Daniel 11, verse 17, it's going to talk about, um, he, is, he shall also set his face to enter the strength of his whole kingdom and the upright ones with him. Thus shall he do. He shall, and he, that is God, shall give him the daughter of women, corrupting her. And she shall not stand neither before him. And then he's going to turn his face towards the isles. So when he uh, sets his face Get, um, to enter the strength with the strength of his whole kingdom. We understood this. Uh, you probably should go here so you can see what I'm looking at. All right. So it says here, um, he pagan Rome under Julius Caesar, George Bush the second, shall set his face to enter um, the strength with the strength of his whole kingdom. And the upright ones with him. So, so we're going to mark this at in this history here is at 9/11. So this is going back to earlier verses. Just and the reason why I bring this up is because the Jews, um, it says the Jewish for, for, forces loyal to Caesar, led by Antipater. So this is going to be in this history dealing with uh, Julius Caesar, and and that's going to be in that history. So when we're dealing with the Battle of Pharsalus, so Julius Caesar is going to be assassinated March 15th, 44 BC. And we're going to have that Battle of Pharsalus. That's going to be, uh, what was the Battle of Pharsalus again? Yeah, that was my question. What was that? So Julius Caesar's, it's part of this civil war that's going on. So it's a decisive battle in Caesar's civil war fought on August 9th, 48 BC or near, BC, near Pharsalus in central Greece, right? Caesar, Julius Caesar and his allies formed up opposite the army of the Roman Republic under the command of Pompey. Pompey had the backing of major Roman senators and his army significantly outnumbered the veterans' Caesarian legions. Pompey reluctantly engaged in battle and suffered an overwhelming defeat, ultimately fleeing the camp and his men disguised as ordinary citizens. So eventually made his way to Egypt. He was assassinated upon his arrival at the order of Ptolemy the 13th. Okay. So this is going to be connected to 
Caesar as a symbol, Caesar's a symbol which we would have with um, time of George Bush. So I'm not sure how to quite sort that out. But the the point is this happens. Uh, during the reign of Julius Caesar. This battle of Pharsalus is part of the Civil War. And um, if we put it in into our history, uh, we would have to try to understand how, the, how that fits. So, And then we have the Battle of Actium. So we have the Battle of Pharsalus, which is, of course, Julius Caesar. Um, and then the Battle of Actium is going to be Augustus. right? And that's him conquering Egypt. So how does this relate to the Jews, to Rome's relationship with the Jews? What is it symbolizing? Any any thoughts or ideas on this? So part of the thing about verse 23 and 24 is it's, it's backtracking and covering the history that we already covered, right? And it's going to go back to this league, and we're saying that it's going to go to 508, AD, covering a period of 666 years. <clears throat> and then we have to decide what Pharsalus and the Battle of Actium have to do with an empowerment of it. So I guess what we would say is that this has to do with uh, the establishing of Rome as, as this Roman Empire. Because between Julius Caesar and Augustus, we have a transition from the Roman Republic to uh, the Roman, what, what do we call it? I mean, we could say it's the Roman Empire because you got an emperor, but um, you know you have the Roman emperors, right? And that's going to set the stage for the crucifixion of Christ. It's going to be under Caesar Augustus that Christ is going to be born, and then it's going to be under Tiberius that Jesus is crucified. And then under Titus, that Jerusalem is destroyed as a general, not as an emperor. And then we're given these spans of time, the 360 years, these two spans of time. And it's going to be from the empowerment of the first angel to the empowerment of the second. So the beginning of the 360 years is an empowerment of the first message. The end is an empowerment of the second and then we have 508 as the arrival of the third message. So what particularly is the second message? How is it testing God's people in the context of Rome? So if we look at the second angel arriving, saying it's in the 70th week, we have this Messiah that has come. Are the Jews accepting the Messiah? Definitely the Jewish leadership isn't, right? It's going to be tested, and it's going to fail that first test. Right? As Dwight kind of dealt with having, we have no king but Caesar. So who's, who's being tested? We know it's God's people, but who more specifically is being tested under the second angel's message? For instance, are any Christians going to be killed in the destruction of Jerusalem? No. So, so they're being tested with the destruction of Jerusalem, right? Yep. Okay. Okay. So, so Christians, in a sense, are being tested here. They're also going to be persecuted. But is that a test for Christians? We would we would have to say persecution is a test. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And one, then, yeah. Okay, go on. One, one small issue on the chart. Okay. I made a mistake. Between, between 27 and 31 AD, 24 doesn't follow that. Yeah, it's just typo there. Okay, 34, thanks. All of this, we, we have the testing, the final testing of the Jewish people, the end of the 490 years coming up here to 34 AD. Yeah. But now we have the test, we have a beginning test for that of the Christian people, whether or not they're going to hold on to their faith. Right, and, and we know that some are going to fail that test. Right. Right. So they're, they're being tested. We would say the destruction of Jerusalem, that is the formalization of that message. And we can look at the message that, you know, Christ is giving regarding the destruction of the temple. So Christ comes, I mean, he's in a sense providing that second angel's message is arriving with Christ. 
but we have a group that fails that test, right? The ones that say we have no king but Caesar. But now you have Christians, and, and they're going to be tested by the destruction of the temple, and then they're going to be persecuted. Now, the Edict of Milan uh, removes that persecution, but many professed Christians uh, end up following this apostate church, the church that compromises, right? So, so Christians are going to fail that test. So when 508 happens, um, with the end of, of the 1260 years of the daily, um, we now, well, it's not, it's coming because they got 30 more years, but in that history, 508 to 538, there is a, there are those that are going to end up basically just following the papacy. So that there's going to be a new message that arrives, which is, of course, addressing the papacy itself, right? But that's, we're not, we're not addressing that here. So papal Rome is going to come in to play. So the daily is going to be removed. There's 30 year period and the papacy is set up. So this is all dealing with, with Rome. Now, even though you have the papacy developing this, in this history, it's, it's Rome as imperial Rome. That was the word I was thinking of. Imperial Rome, uh, that is going to be doing this persecution. Later, it's going to be papal Rome. So this, this, this is about Rome, right? Which, you know, is first a republic and then an empire. So imperial Rome. Um, okay. Anything else about this line? So a lot of information here. Anything else we need to notice? I have a question. Okay. Uh, what is the, uh, you get six, two, five, six with the stars and it equals 360. What is that? Okay. That's the Hebrew number, H6256. It's the word time even for a time. And if you take six times two times five times six, it equals 360. Oh, I so got it's, you. Okay. it's just another way to show that when it says even for a time, which we take is 360 years, if you take the Hebrew number and you multiply the digits, it also gives you 360. I got you. Okay. So that's an interesting little detail that confirms the idea of using the Hebrew number to represent symbols for time yeah yeah it is interesting because we already understand that even for a time means 360 years right but yeah taking uh you know 12 times uh 30 because six times two is 12 and five times six is 30 so you get 12 times 30 that's 360 so um okay so that yeah so we have a lot of symbols here in this structure that that we can understand, right? That we have the six six six, we have the seven 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 symbols, we have all, all kinds of prophetic symbols in this history uh, that we we can't ignore. So we know that this this is sound. Maybe our explanation of it needs more refining. Are you going to put some of these charts on the Daniel eleven paper? Yep, they're all going to be in there. Okay. Yeah, so they'll all be in the paper. Okay, I'm just thinking here as I'm looking at it. Yeah, so the second message makes sense. You know, Christ comes. We have this testing. It's empowered with this fulfillment of these 360 years. And then you have that period of time which persecution of, of Christians by paganism still continues. Right of true Christians, even though the apostate church uh, gets off the hook, because that's not really going to help, you know, the heretics. So we got the heretics here are going to still have trouble. Any other thoughts on this chart? Are we more satisfied with this than what we had before? And so, so we've added two dates. We've added, uh, you know, the siege of Jerusalem by Pompey, and then 508. I thought Pompey's siege had been in there to always. To- to begin with, but we just moved the formalization to the siege. 
No, no, we didn't actually have it when we first drew, drew this yesterday. We didn't have the seeds. We talked about it at the end of the study saying we probably need it in there. Okay. So I put it in there yesterday and then, um, you know, on my own study. And then we looked at it and we, we then put the way marks there. So because once we put it in there, well, we now had too many way marks. But it makes sense to take the two 360s and tie them together at the beginning and the end as one, one way mark. Because in a sense, you know, when you look at this line, you you could um, you could choose one or the other. I mean, you could just choose Pharsalus and the Edict of Milan, or you could choose just the Battle of Actium and, you know, the dedication of Constantinople. But but we believe that both symbols apply. And so that's why we, we have them both there, but they're both, and, and they're both empowerments. So, I mean, this is, I mean, I think this is a very nice structure, whether it's a hundred percent correct or not. I mean, there's something that we, and, and I think it explains the messages it explains the period of darkness. And, and, and so it's going to, deal with with Rome itself that's 666 years so the Jews fail to recognize that and then when we get to 508 you know we now have the beginning of the 1290 and the 1335 right right so so that's all going to fit in right just it's not so part would, of, it's not part of a pagan Rome but it's going to be part of papal Rome so 508 would be like a league uh Popery of the league with the European nations. Well, in 508, I mean, the thing that we 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 mark in 508 uh, is the baptism of Clovis on December 25th. Yeah, which, it's kind of kind of a league, kind of a league. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So it's it's. I mean, pagan Rome becomes papal Rome. It, it's the part of that process of what happens with the Roman Empire becoming, I mean, truly Catholic, if that makes sense. I mean, obviously, you know, you have Constantine, but I mean, he's politically Catholic um, and he's involved in some of the religion. But but you have all of Rome. You have these these um, because Rome is going to be destroyed. Right. So we get the end of Rome. What? Uh, in 476. So, so now these Germanic tribes have conquered Rome, and and then they're going to set, that is, the king of France, the Franks. They're going to set the Pope upon the on the king on the throne of the earth, right? And they're also going to take him off. So that's why you know there's there's a lot more to this. This is just addressing this history. But we're going to then have papal Rome. And so when we look at papal Rome, we're obviously going to have a line similar to this. It's going to be 1260 years. Um, you know, it's going to bring us to the time of the end, right in Daniel 11, verse 40, A. And then we're going to have uh, another line that's going to address modern Rome, which is Daniel 11, verse 40, B, to our time. And, and, and it's going to be fairly complex like, to put it all together in these lines. But I, I think this is sound, you know, overall. I mean, this is, you know, we've just had a few days to look at it. So what we're saying is that the these two verses, Daniel 11, verse 23 and 24, are going to be this repeat of history defining uh, from this league, the Roman Jewish League, to what happens in 508, in a sense, another type of league, right? Yeah, it seems to seems to line up. Yeah, and it's leading to papal Rome. So, so we're dealing with pagan Rome here, leading to papal Rome, and we know the transition happens in the sixth century. Elmites really clear in the Great Controversy, chapter three, I think. One dealing with uh, Second Thessalonians. So anyway, I, I don't know what else we could say about it right now. I mean, I'm trying to 
I don't want to really look too much at how we're going to apply this. The only thing that we can say, so I guess I could go back here. Where is it? Um, so when we have it in our history, even for a time, right, we ended up with, with this, this structure going back to 1989. Um, so if we're going to take this one, so one of the, one of the things that we, we would have to look at is why is this a little bit different? This one is going to end um, December 25th in 21. And we could see, well, if we have the third angel arriving on um, 508 on December 25th with the baptism of Clovis, that's pretty good. We could say uh, that 1989 to 911 is that um, period from 161 to 158, and then and then here we would have this the first angel in power. The question is, how are we going to line this up with the other line? So that's that's just the main thing is we have these symbols in that line. We have these way marks, and do we just line them up directly like what we have, or is there more to it? Because then you're going to have because in this line, right, we have we have placed the um, arrival, the formalization, the empowerment, uh, the second angel arriving, formalization, the empowerment, and the third angel arriving. Do we just stick this all of those right where the other ones are? Is that how we do it? Right. So that's one of the things we're going to have to decide on. So tomorrow we're going to look at that. We'll we'll decide, you know, at least get a basic idea of how we're going to to do this. But you know, then Jeff's summary, the second angel arriving. That's what we have here. You know, is that you know the cross? You know, the formalization is November 9th, two thousand nineteen, uh, parallel to the destruction of Jerusalem in seventy A.D is the period of 777 days, uh, you know, connected in some way. Uh, are we going to line up December 25th, 2021 with Clovis baptism in 508? And the second angel empowered is just that period of 777 days, which would be from 313 to 330. It's a period of 17 years. You know, how do we line that up? You understand what I'm saying? It's just, is it just, we, we figured out the way marks here and we have the way marks in the other line and they're just the same way marks. Those histories then are illustrating this history. So that's one way to do it. So we could say it's already done for us, right? We, we, we would have to discuss that more uh, tomorrow. Okay. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay. Let's pray. A dear father in heaven, we thank you for this day for all your blessings, for your goodness and love. And we just pray that you can be with us in all that we do, that we can glorify your name upon this earth. And uh, I pray for each person, pray for our families and friends, that your angels can watch over them. And we pray, Lord, that um, we can come together again to study these things according to thy will. And we pray it and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.